Good morning. Today's scripture reading will be Ephesians 5.15. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. I want to invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5, if you're not there already. And today, we're going to be thinking about walking as wise or living in wisdom. And so here's some wisdom from the office to ponder as we open our Bibles up to Ephesians chapter 5. Actually, this is a really good summary of this passage in many ways and what I have to say this morning. The only thing we really need to do to alter this is to take out uh, the word idiot and replace it with the word fool, and then it would be more biblically accurate. But this is a good idea of what we ought to do as followers of Jesus Christ Live not as fools, but as wise. As we begin to dive into these verses, one of the things I hope that you take away from this chapel message is the way that Paul, as a good Old Testament scholar and student, presents his thoughts in these verses. In a section that's devoted to the necessity of wisdom in the Christian life, Paul does something very beautiful here. He actually patterns his word structure after Hebrew wisdom literature, following a certain parallelism in the way that he communicates his message. If you look carefully through this section, you will see a number of couplets of stanzas or kola that are functionally parallel to one another. In Hebrew parallelism, one stanza does not necessarily say the exact same thing as the following stanza, and we'll see this in this section. It may present a complementary thought, an elaboration, or even an antithetical comparison, to name just a few possibilities. So I've attempted to highlight the parallel statements in the visuals that you will see up on the screen and we'll make reference to these throughout our time together this morning. So verses 15 and 16, I'm gonna look at a little bit broader of a section than Landon read for us. Verse 15 says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Paul invites us to pay attention to the way that we walk as Christians. And as you well know from our series in chapel this spring, walk is a metaphor for our lives as followers of Christ. It is our Christian conduct. We should pay attention to and be careful with the way we live. Our lives are to be lived deliberately, intentionally, before the Lord. We should not simply go about our days aimlessly, but purposefully. Now, deliberate Christian living involves walking the path of wisdom. Old Testament authors had much to say about the path of wisdom. If you're taking any of our interpretation classes, you're probably learning about something of the genre of literature in the Old Testament that we call Wisdom literature, it's geared toward instructing the follower of Yahweh in living a life that is pleasing to him and useful for his purposes. This kind of life is one characterized by wisdom as opposed to folly. The Psalter opens with this wonderful instruction about these two ways of walking, the path of the fool and the path of the wise. Listen to Psalm chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, 
nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. That's the way of the wise. Then in verses four and five, he contrasts that with the way of the fool. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Jesus also had much to say about walking in the way of wisdom. Matthew closes his account of the Sermon on the Mount with Jesus' parable of the wise and foolish builders. Do you want to sing the song? No? Okay. I won't sing it by myself. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, 24 and 25, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell. And the floods came, sounds like yesterday, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Jesus never intended his teaching to be merely philosophical or strictly intellectual. The telos, the final destination of his doctrine, of doctrine in scripture is always application. Second, here we're to make the best use of time because the days are evil. What does Paul mean by this? Commentator Peter O'Brien sees a connection between this passage and Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, which says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. O'Brien says, although believers live in the midst of these evil days as they await their final redemption, they are neither to avoid them nor to fear them. Rather, they are to live wisely, taking advantage of every opportunity in this fallen world to conduct themselves in a manner that is pleasing to God. The world as we presently know it is passing away. We are running out of time then to live for Christ in this present world before things as we know it will change forever. Too many followers of Christ today live without any sense of urgency or expectation. Christ has told us in his word that he is coming again soon. Paul reminds us here that we should be about the business of our king, living wisely in the world, seizing the day, carpe diem, capturing each moment and utilizing it for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe it was Benjamin Franklin who said, dost thou love life? Then do not squander time for that is the stuff life is made of. Use your time wisely for the glory of the Lord Jesus, not foolishly for your own self and your own purposes. Verses 17 and 18. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, in verses 17 and 18, Paul presents two sentences containing two parallel statements each that offer a negative command related to the Christian walk followed by a positive command. The first negative command is that we are not to be foolish. In the words of Dwight Schrute, don't be an idiot. He has already said in verse 15 that we should not walk as those who are unwise, and now Paul makes his command explicit 
in saying that followers of Christ are not to live as fools. What does it mean to be foolish? Our friend from Biblical Eldership Resources and Bible.org, Mr. Bob Deffenbaugh, lists nine characteristics of a fool that he finds in the book of Proverbs. These are probably not exhaustive, but Mr. Deffenbaugh notes that the fool is unrighteous, unwise, unrealistic, undisciplined, unreliable, unteachable, unpleasant, unliked, and undesirable. Seeing that list, I know there are many times that I have a propensity toward foolishness. It is only by the Spirit of God at work in us that we can avoid the way of the fool and pursue the path of wisdom. Rather than living as fools, positively, Paul says, we are to understand what the will of the Lord is. Here, the will of the Lord is not his mysterious, unknown will, sometimes called by theologians the sovereign or decretive will of God, The will of God in view here is his moral or prescriptive will, that which he intends as the ideal for all based on his perfectly righteous and holy character. It is that perfect will of God that he has revealed to humanity by his spirit in his word. If you want to live in a right relationship with the Lord, then walking in wisdom and not living as a fool, then you must understand what's the Lord, what the Lord's will is, and the Lord's will has been revealed to us through his word. The word of God is essential to the Christian life. You could say, to use physical metaphors, as water and food are essential to the life of the body, And as oxygen is essential to the functioning of the heart and the brain, even so, the word of God is just as absolutely essential to spiritual life and health and growth. Herbert Hoover once said, wisdom consists not so much in knowing what to do in the ultimate as knowing what to do next. Our daily walking in wisdom is dependent upon our understanding of the will of the Lord as revealed in the pages of Scripture. We have to know the Word of God better, deeper, much more intricately than we do. Wonderfully, we have entire books of the Bible devoted to the topic of wisdom. Dr. Dan Smith, our former chancellor and president of Emmaus for many years, who has been promoted to glory now several years ago, used to strongly encourage students to read through a proverb each day of the month. There are usually about 30, 31 days in a month, and there are 31 chapters of the book of Proverbs, This practice over time would yield great fruits of wisdom and knowledge. Listen to me. The fastest and best path to wisdom comes through a patient and faithful diet of the Word of God. The second negative command is that we are not to get drunk with wine. For a follower of Jesus, intoxication with any substance, not just alcohol, goes against the will of our God who desires us to have ownership of our own thoughts and to commit that to him. Not simply our thoughts, but our feelings, desires, actions, all of it. We can and should extend Paul's thought here beyond the narrow limitation of being drunk on wine exclusively to intoxications and addictions more broadly. The bigger principle is a lack of self-control on the part of a believer in Christ to the extent that we would give control 
of either parts or the whole of us to something or someone other than the Spirit of God. When you give yourself over to another substance, you are forfeiting control of yourself to that substance. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you, excuse me, whom you have from God? You are not your own, you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Of course, in the context of 1 Corinthians 6, Paul warns against believers uniting their bodies with a prostitute through sexual immorality. But the principle is larger than merely sexual immorality. We should unite, uh, not unite our bodies or invite into our bodies anything or anyone that would dishonor the Lord who bought us with his own blood and now owns us. Followers of Jesus Christ are called to live self-controlled lives, not giving our bodies or minds over to external influences for pleasure or experiencing temporary rushes or highs, but submitting all of ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The second positive command that Paul gives here is that we are to be filled with the Spirit. Now, this command is harder, perhaps, for us to understand. What does Paul mean that we are to be filled with the Spirit? Weren't we filled with God's Spirit at the moment of our salvation? Don't we have the Spirit permanently dwelling within us? What can the apostle mean by this admonition? There are three clues in this passage that help us interpret Paul's somewhat elusive statement that we should be filled with the Spirit. And following Paul's example, I'm going to try to be a little poetic with these three clues. How about three Ps this morning? Three Ps that describe what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Here are the three Ps, and I'll expand on each of these. Parallelism, parity, and participles. Okay? First of all, parallelism. Let's take a look at the entire section again so far. I've already said I think Paul is being very Old Testament-y in his language here. Thank you. We've seen the parallel stanzas that he employs to contrast the way of the fool and the way of the wise. I think it's instructive to notice red was a bad choice. To notice the phrases that are parallel to what we have here in verse 18 when Paul instructs us to be filled with the Spirit. So, verse 15 again, look carefully then how you walk. And the paralleled statement, not as unwise but as wise, tells us exactly how we are to walk. We're not to walk as fools, we're not to walk as unwise, but to live wisely. Expanding on that thought, then in verse 16, we walk carefully by making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Verse 17 and 18 further expand this thought of living in wisdom. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Part of walking in wisdom, then, is understanding the Lord's will. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So being filled with the Spirit, we should at least say... Uh, has something to do with or a direct correlation then between walking in the Spirit and the admonitions that precede it. Namely, being careful how we walk, walking in wisdom rather than folly, making the best use of our present time, and understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, rather than understanding the filling of the Spirit as any one of these things in particular, we should rather understand that Paul is using complementary language to describe what the mature Christian life looks like. Life in the Spirit is to be intentional, purposeful, purposeful, 
careful, devoted to the Lord and to his word and seeking to grow in wisdom. That's where I think the parallelism of the passage helps us out. Secondly, parity. The parity between images of drunkenness on the one hand and being filled with the Spirit on the other hand is important to consider. How is being drunk with wine similar to and yet distinct from being filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, both involve giving ourselves over to another, yielding control of our lives to something or someone else. Negatively, in the case of alcohol, being drunk is yielding control of ourselves to the substance that we put into our body. In contrast to getting drunk, Paul presents yielding control of our persons to the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Spirit, then, is like giving up our own selfish desire for control of our life and offering ourselves, to use the language of Paul in another place, as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. So there is a parity to understand between the images of drunkenness and being filled with the Spirit. Finally, participles. Paul presents a series of participles in verses 19 through 21 that help to explain what he means by be filled with the Spirit in verse 18. He says in verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The first descriptive participle then points us toward our relationships with other believers. We should address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. What does Paul have in mind here? Well, I don't think he has in mind we only use language of the psalms when we speak to one another. That's not the point or the purpose. A better way to understand this is that our speech with one another should be centered on God and his word. Paul says the same thing using slightly different language in Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts, to God. What do we talk about when we're together with other believers in Christ? Are we encouraging one another with the word of God, exhorting one another toward greater faith and love, edifying one another and building each other up with scripture? Or do we just talk about the things the rest of the world is consumed with? Part of what it looks like to be filled with the Spirit is to have God's Word not only on your mind, but in your mouth. Does that characterize you as a follower of the Lord Jesus? Secondly, he says, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. These second and third participles, singing and making melody, are directed not from person to person, but from believers toward the Lord. This is God word. This is true praise and worship from our hearts, our inner persons, our true selves to our God. Again, the parallel in Colossians there, in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Again, I don't think the point of Paul here is that you're supposed to walk around singing everything to everyone. Our lives are not to be like a a living uh, melody, melodious uh, uh, musical. But, I mean, if that's your thing, more power to you. But, inside... In our hearts, in our minds, the inward part of us, we should be constantly communicating with the Lord, adoring Him, worshiping Him, 
lifting up our praises to Him, there's an internal song then to the life of the follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have that internal melody that characterizes your heart and your life? Verses 20 and 21, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This communication from us to the Lord reflects a genuine gratitude for what Jesus has done on our behalf. Giving thanks is an essential aspect of prayer. And we're to do this always and for everything, Paul says here. We direct our gratitude Notice this, toward God the Father, and we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is then a Trinitarian shape to prayer, whereby we we pray by the Spirit who enables us and fills us. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and on the basis of his work accomplished for us on the cross. And we pray to God the Father who receives our thanks and hears our requests. And finally, verse 21, final participle here is submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ or out of reverence for Jesus our Messiah. Now, submitting to one another means to yield our own desires and wants and even needs for what is most beneficial for the building up of others. Paul says it this way in his letter to the Philippians. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. This is the attitude Jesus had in leaving his home in heaven to take on human flesh and die on our behalf. And we are to put on this disposition as followers of Jesus Christ also. Being filled with the Spirit then looks a lot like the spiritual disciplines of reading and applying the Word of God, communing with and worshiping with the Lord in prayer, and emulating the love of Christ in our relationships with others. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to walk in wisdom in this life. We do that, first of all, by not living as fools and making the best use of our time, not squandering it, not wasting it, understanding the will of the Lord as it has been revealed to us in Scripture and being filled with the Spirit of God. We are filled with God's Spirit as we encourage other believers with God's Word as we worship and adore the Lord in our heart, as we give thanks to the Lord in prayer, and as we display sacrificial love in our relationships with one another. God wants you to be wise. But wisdom doesn't come without time and great effort. James 1.5 says, it's here on the screen, if any of you lacks wisdom, (laughs) that's me, is that you? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Choose the way of wisdom and not the way of folly. And if you, like me, recognize that you have a long way to go in the realm of wisdom, ask God to supply it, even while making good use of the sources of wisdom that he has already supplied. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do want to be wise. We want to live our lives as followers of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, walking
the path of wisdom that Jesus perfectly laid out for us, that is given to us in full instruction in your word. We, we desire wisdom, Father. And we recognize that many times, although we desire the good, we fall into the path of the fool. Lord, will you help us by your Spirit to pursue wisdom through our knowledge of you, through our knowledge of your Son, the Lord Jesus, and through the application of your wonderful truth in the way that we live and love one another. Teach us to be wise, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.